We're doing this series, this three-week series called Undefiled in a couple churches, coast to coast, that I, that I said are kind of at the vanguard. We're piloting this, refining it, because we think it's a message that's going to change lives and really change the world. I'll be that bold to say we think it's going to have impact that is going to allow the Holy Spirit to move afresh in people's lives. And you guys are a part of it. And, you know, from the first moment we started talking, uh, we at Pure Hope had our eyes on Lost City as a community to walk together in this for a couple of reasons. First of all, we love Pastor Sam. We love all of you. Uh, but also we share the same heartbeat. At Pure Hope, uh, we're a ministry doing work across the country, even across the globe, uh, working towards our vision of a world free of sexual exploitation and brokenness. And we work towards that vision of a world free by providing Christian solutions in this sexualized culture. We live in a totally sexualized, pornified, jacked up culture. And it's affecting every single one of us. And we need to be equipped to be followers of Jesus in this culture. But I think that is a parallel and indeed uh, just right in line with your heartbeat uh, here at Lost City for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm going to tell you what you guys are all about. This is from your website, so let me just repeat it back to you. You guys are apparently all about Jesus, which is what this series is all about, and that's what we're about at Pure Hope. We're about pursuing the purity of Jesus at Pure Hope. This series is about looking into the darkness, but then finding ways to pursue the love, purity, and justice of Jesus in the society, right in line with what you guys are about with Jesus. Second, your family. And here's what you say about being a family. I'm repeating your website to you. I know. I'll get past this in a second. But it's so good and so rich. I wanted to read it. A community, this is you guys, that holds each other accountable, encourages each other, and forgives one another. A church that will not be satisfied with mediocre faith and will encourage each other to pursue God in complete surrender. That's what this series is all about. That's why we're excited. Thirdly, you're about life on mission, and there's no question that that's what this is all about. This is about doing the will of God in our own lives and then collectively letting that go forth to change the world. So that's what we're going to cover, and that's why we're excited, excited about doing it together. Now, my daughters aren't in the room anymore, and usually I love to share stories about them because they're so rich. You know, we're told to become like children, and I think the only way you can become like a child is to learn from children. So I learn from them often, but my daughter was a little anxious today and um, maybe pinky promise that I wouldn't tell stories. Because it's a little embarrassing, of course. So even though she's not in the room, I'm not going to tell stories. But I will tell a story about someone else's kids. Uh, I have a friend who was, uh, had the kids in the back seat, small children, and was trying to get into the house. He pulled up in the driveway, and his clicker for the garage door wasn't working. The garage door's not open, and they're locked out. He's sitting in the driveway. So he's thinking, maybe I just got to hit it right. He's going in reverse in front and kind of looking pretty dumb there in the driveway and cranking on it, getting angry. And finally, his young daughter just said, um, Daddy, I think God's trying to tell you something. <laughs> So he said, okay, I'll wait. That moment, his wife comes in, boom, clicks it, and they all go in together. The point for me when he told me that story was we need each other. We can't do this alone. We can strive. We can bang on things. We can try to change the world ourselves. We can try to change ourselves all by ourselves, and it's not going to work. We need one another. I think that's a big part of this message today, what we're going to look at, especially as we look at these dark injustices, again, like Sam said, and like the video said, of human trafficking and sexual exploitation and the reality of this all around us. The whole thing, though, comes down to one verse. This whole series, the next three weeks we're going to be talking about, comes down to one verse. That verse is James 1.27, which says that pure and undefiled religion is this, that those of us who love our God would care for the fatherless and the widow in their distress and keep ourselves unstained by the world. So we're going to look at an injustice that many of us maybe have touched, seen, learned about, some of us are doing things about. We're going to drill a little deeper in this series. We're going to look at what is God saying to us as to how we need to live out a life that's pure and undefiled every single day in a way that's going to impact others all around us. So why peer into the darkness at all? And um, I want to hit this because the video we watched already is pretty intense. The subject we're talking about is intense. Why do we do this? Aren't we supposed to come in and be happy and, and holy and healthy and just go out and, and encourage one another with a backslap? Well, here's what I think. I think as we follow Jesus in this world, in a broken world, a defiled world, one filled with injustice and evil, we need to peer into that. We need to courageously look into the things that are, the devourer, as the scripture says, is doing to destroy. Because that is the only way that we will see the true hope, the true light of Christ in our lives. It's the only way. My wife and I experienced this about 15 years ago. We learned about this injustice, and God started directing our steps, and we were going places to learn and educate ourselves and make a difference. Uh, we found ourselves in uh, a Central American capital, uh, going around with a State Department group, looking at the issues of human trafficking and how women especially 
and children were being exploited in this capital city. And we went down to the darkest area of the city where there's all kinds of crime and injustice. We saw women being bought and sold. We saw up in the windows where they hid them, the, the six, seven, and eight-year-old girls that were being sold to men from across the world. And we came out of that and we were just sick to our stomach. But as we looked at each other after that and felt this revulsion and felt this sickness, we both agreed that for the first time in our lives, we realized what it truly meant to say, come Lord Jesus. That's what happens, I think, when you peer into the darkness. We live in this world right now. We live in this culture. We live in Dallas, Texas. Everything can be kind of glitzy. We've got most of our basic needs met. But when we look into the darkness of the suffering of others, when we look into our heart, that's when we start to see that we need a Savior. And this world does. And we start crying out with even more fervor. And that's what the Lord wants. That's what he wants. He wants us to be passionate, and he wants us to desire him. That's this series, three weeks. And we're going to get into it right now with the first uh, sermon, which is titled Unbound. This is all about being unbound and what Scripture says about freeing those who are in captivity. So I'm going to start with a text. It's so Leviticus 19.29. We can read this together. It should be up on the screen. And then after I read it, I'm going to pause and just pray real quick and invite the Holy Spirit to come into this. Okay. So we're reading Leviticus 19.29, and this is the New Living uh, Translation. Do not defile your daughter by making her a prostitute, or the land will be filled with prostitution and wickedness. Father, we thank you. We pause right now, just as we read your word, that you would open up our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things out of your word. We pray that even in the midst of this darkness, you would bring a joy to us right now and an expectancy and a desire for you that is new and fresh. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come in and open up our eyes and our hearts. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so context of this verse, Leviticus 19. This is like one verse, we're pulling it out, and it's kind of like, whoa, I didn't even know the Bible talked about that stuff. What's, what's going on here? Well, this is the people of Israel. They came out of bondage and slavery. Moses had brought them out. They're an entire nation now, walking out into the desert, into the wilderness. And one thing that God is doing is training them up, because they've lived in Egypt for generations now, in slavery, and they've been freed. But they still lived in that nation, and that nation was full of injustice full of slavery, full of class warfare. People lived in dire poverty. More than anything, there was prostitution, there was idolatry, and there was vileness. And this is what the people of Israel, even though God had chosen them, they were surrounded by that, and it was still part of who they were. That's why some people say, you know, it took one day for God to take Israel out of Egypt. It took 40 years in the desert for him to take Egypt out of Israel because they come out of an environment that was very materialistic, very sacrilegious, and very violent. And prostitution was normalized just like it was across the globe. And we'll find out just the way it is right now still. But in all these nations that God was bringing his people out of, and all the nations that they were walking through as they were going to this promised land, prostitution, sexual violence, and sexual exploitation were just part of the fabric. Women, children, the poor, men and boys in many cases, were sacrificed as temple prostitutes and exploited and broken and kept in this bondage. That was part of the DNA of this whole region, this whole society. So he's had to say to them verses like this. And it says that when Moses read this law, he would read it to all the people, including the children. They talk about this issue saying, do not defile your daughter by making her a prostitute or prostituting her out, or else the land will be filled with wickedness. Now, I hope you can see some relevance for us right there. If you know the story, God took them out by the blood of the lamb that they put over their door, and he brought them out as a nation, out of slavery, into a place of promise, and into a wilderness where they were journeying to that destination point that they hadn't reached yet. It sounds a lot like our journeys. When we come to Jesus, he frees us from the bondage of our sin. By the blood of the lamb, it says. We're saved by the blood of the lamb, who is Jesus. And we're saved by the power of our testimony of his saving grace. And then he brings us in the wilderness, and we're there right now. Dallas might seem pretty civilized, but we're in the wilderness of a journey in life where we're being formed and transformed all the way. And part of that is the same thing that the nation of Israel is going through. We're being transformed in a way that's taking out the old and taking out the idolatrous nature of our heart and slowly taking out the wounds and the pains and the memories of slavery and the desires that do not line up with God's word. He's doing that work in us right now. So this verse is totally relevant for us. It's right where I think we need to be. That's part of our message at Pure Hope every single day, and that's part of this message for the next three weeks. This is for us, and this issue is relevant to us, even if we think it seems remote, even if we think that sex trafficking and human slavery is not something that touches us. Deeply relevant for us. 
So, as I said, this context is for us, and I'm going to start with the first part of that verse to talk about this a little bit more deeply. Do not defile your daughter by making her a prostitute. Here's the reality. Men, women, and children are defiled across the world in prostitution all around us. Globally, between 20 to 30 million people are in slavery right now, and roughly 4.5 million are kept in sexual servitude. This is happening all around us. And when I first learned about this, I was like, okay, that sounds bad, and I'm actually moved. Let me go do something about that. For my case, that was go to law school and let's go to the places of the world like, you know, Bangkok and Amsterdam and maybe Mumbai and places where people are kept in slavery. Let's go do something about that. Well, my wife and I did that. We started to realize, hey, this doesn't just happen over there or over there or over there. This happens right around us. Wherever we live, this is happening. It looks different in different places because cultures are different. The laws are different. Governments are different. But it happens all around us. This bondage happens all around us. In fact, the U.S. government says that uh, 10,000 women and girls are trafficked for sex into the U.S. every year, and between 100,000 and 250,000 U.S. teenagers and children are trafficked into prostitution and pornography every single year. This is right here in our communities. This is right here in Dallas. 250,000 every single year. Think of Cowboy Stadium, that shrine, that mecca of luxury and mediocre football. <laughs> think of that, and think of three of those lined up filled with children and teenagers. It's about a quarter of a million people, and that's how many right around us every single year are being trafficked into this. This matters. It matters to us because it's happening to us. It's happening to our children. It's happening in our communities. It's happening to the community that Lost City is all about rescuing and bringing the light of Christ into. So we need to know, but then we need to go deeper and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Let me give you a definition of sex trafficking. And this is more for next week. All this is going to tie together. We're going to go a little deeper next week into how this really, I think, impacts our homes. But according to U.S. law, this is the definition of sex trafficking. The recruitment, the harboring, the transportation, the provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Let me tell you something. That happens every single day all around us. It happens in places that are a little more far-flung. It happens in California, which is the global hub of the porn industry. That's how women and children get sucked in. It happens right here in Dallas. It happens to uh, people who we run into every single day. It happens in the suburbs. It happens in the city. This is all around us. And here's a typical story of a young woman especially who's going to be vulnerable and who's being exploited right now, who's being exploited right now, last night, this weekend, right here. Usually a young girl, 12, 13, 14, entering into prostitution who was abused in childhood by a trusted adult. Sometimes, 90% of the time, in fact, in some regions, it was the parents who abused. And then this child, this teenager, is groomed for manipulation and promiscuity by adolescents. Now, I asked a friend of mine who came out of the sex industry, who was abused as a child, who was put into strip clubs, who was trafficked into Mexico. I said, talk to me about grooming. What, is, what does grooming mean to you? And she's been healed now. She's brought out of this. She has two children. She's a single mom. I said, what does grooming mean to you? And she said, grooming is what you're trained and conditioned and formed to be and what to expect in life. And she said, I was formed to be, expect my own exploitation. I was formed to make myself into an object for other people's use. This is happening. I'm a father of two daughters. And every time I turn on TV, I see advertising that's doing that exact same thing. Every time I walk down the mall, I see advertising that's doing that exact same thing. And what's that doing on the other side? Men are exploited too, but by and large, we're talking about an issue where we as men are the exploiters. And we are grooming young boys in our society to be exploiters and to see human beings who are created in the image of God, male and female, only as objects. That's why you get a crass society, and that's why it says in Scripture, and God said to the people of Israel, you will not, like all the other nations, cause your daughters, cause your sisters, cause your mothers, cause your friends to be prostitutes because then the whole land falls into wickedness. And I think that's what we see. We see it in the U.S. We see prostitution under the radar on the backpages.com of the world where you can buy a person like that. Porn, the porn industry based right here, we're being groomed to exploit people. And I think you can see, as we walk out, we walk out of this room, we see how wickedness is flourishing. You see how wickedness flourishes when you tolerate and contribute to even the exploitation or the objectification of a human being who's made so precious in God's sight, who's made so precious. And I'm going to stop right there because I told you this message is about grace. Even as we talk about this information and some statistics that help us get our mind around the issue, if you've been abused, if you've been hurt, I don't know, maybe you did something last night. 
Maybe you went someplace, did something that you're feeling guilty about right now. God's grace is right here for you this morning. He wants you. He is pursuing you. And this message brings healing. When we just open up and we'll do this together. And we'll talk at the end about coming to the cross together with one another. But we gave this message last week in California. I was at a church and we were talking about this issue of sex trafficking. And a woman came up to me in tears afterwards who for the last 40 years has been bearing the secret and the pain of how her father sexually abused her when she was five years old. This is real. This is real for all of us. And I want you to know that God does not see you as undefiled, as defiled. He has purified you. We are now undefiled in his love. And I want you to know that. And I want us to break the power of the secret that the deceiver keeps us in in our lives because that's what this is all about. That's ultimately what this is all about. When the Bible says prostitution, in the Greek, when we get to the New Testament, the word it uses is porne. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's the root of the word pornography, which means depictions of prostitution. Porne graphos. Prostitution. Pornography. Then it says, don't be engaged in sexual immorality, which is the Greek word porneia. Porne. Pornography. Porneia. All these things are related. And that's where when I started to look at this issue and said, I'm going to go save the world. I'm going to get rid of human trafficking. I dug deeper and I realized, my goodness, my porneia drives and cultivates that porne, that prostitution, that trafficking that I said I'm going to be against. And that's when my heart started to get changed by this. And I started to realize I've got a role beyond just going places on short-term mission trips or choosing a career that's going to free people. I've got a role to make choices every single day, the thousand small choices I make with my eyes and with my thoughts and with my attitudes. That's where justice starts. In fact, that was brought home to me just recently. We were in Florida for vacation. And... Um, I went to work out uh, partly because I needed to work out and partly because we had 20 people in one house and I just needed to get away. So I got the keys to the fitness place and in this uh, complex, this, this neighborhood where we were, uh, the fitness place was pretty small and it was part of the pool complex. So I got the key and, and went and I was, ran down there, just going to get a quick workout in. And as I walked in to go left here to the fitness center, you, you, just, you look at the pool right there and then the hot tub's right over there. And I wasn't wearing my... Uh, uh, my contact lenses. Sometimes I do that. As long as I'm not driving, it's okay. Trust me, I can see. But uh, I can't see everything. And so sometimes I don't put them in. And sometimes I walk around without them intentionally because there's so many details in this world I don't need to see. And it's almost a measure of self-protection. Well, here's a case in point. I walked in and the hot tub was over there and there were two people in it. I could see that. Uh, and, and, and the one person was kind of where my eyes went because here's what I could see. I couldn't see details, but I could see it was a female. I could see she had blonde hair and I could see she had a black bikini in the hot tub. That's all I could see. I just walk in and I go to the fitness center. And all that time as I'm in the fitness center, because the window is right here as I was doing the lap pulls, I'm a man. And my eyes were being drawn. I felt the draw to look. I can't even tell you why, except that I have a sin nature. And as my friend Bill Struthers, who's a professor at Wheaton College, says, because he's a neuroscientist and he's researched this, he says, we're wired to look for skin. You see skin, you notice it. Uh, whether it's a man or a woman, if it's a woman in a bikini, you notice it. Whether you're a man or a woman, if it's a man in a bikini, you notice it. And often you don't want to, but your, your eyes, are they just go there. And there's something that's hardwired about that. Uh, but our sin nature distorts it. And so as I was working out, I was thinking about this. I'm like, why do I want to keep looking out the window? And the Holy Spirit was all over me because he was showing me, you want to do justice? This is where it plays out. You can look. You can just let your eyes go like that. You're doing an injustice to your wife who you're covenanted to. You're doing an injustice to your daughters who you do not want other people to objectify. And so it was warfare right there. And I'm thankful for it. And I've come to the place where the Lord's prepared me for that because my own sin is grievous. And I could sit here and confess all day if we wanted to, but that's not what we're here for. But the Lord's been showing me this, and it's changed some of my habits and behaviors. One thing is I've had to cut out media in my life because I'm going to tell you what, we live in an image-driven society, and images have a deep and profound impact on us. And I think if I watched in this stage of my life right now more images, if I was watching more films than I was, if I was online more than I was, if I was looking at advertisements uh, more than I was, then it would have been harder for me as I'm in this scenario. Because it wouldn't have just been that I want to just gratify myself for a second to look at a human being as an object. My mind, I would not have been able to control because I would have been thinking about, let's be honest, porn scenes that jump out at me online. I would have been thinking about the bachelor scenes if I had been watching that and all the hot tubs there. You see, what you're putting in affects how you respond to these situations. And I think that's why sometimes, too, we can get so 
kind of dulled that we can walk through our society and not see even the exploitation all around us. I can't drive down Harry Hines Boulevard anymore without looking at that and recognizing all those hotels and all those brothels and all those strip clubs. There are women who's somebody's daughter who's being exploited and who is crying out for somebody, first of all, not even to rescue them, but just to not look at them as an object. Crying out for somebody just to say a kind word and recognize them as a human being who bears God's image. Those are the small things. Those are the first acts of justice that we're called to every single day. But, again, we live in a society where this is all over us now. I mean, you know, the 2012 New Delhi rape case, obviously that has changed or is changing Indian society. A woman was was raped and then died of her injuries. Uh, But that's the society that, one, where prostitution is rife and normalized, that's what happens. In our own society, my wife and I have already had to take our daughters out of a preschool where the headmaster was put in jail for child pornography and rape. Right there in our own preschool. This is what happens when prostitution is normalized and accepted. There's well-known examples. Vegas, Amsterdam, these are places where, you know, the stuff thrives and you see the wickedness and you see the harm and you see this all around us. But maybe you've never been to Vegas or Amsterdam. I've been to Amsterdam. I haven't been to Vegas. But this brings us right into our homes, puts it right into our kids' hands. Vegas is right at your fingertips now. You say, well, I've never done anything that, you know, I've done prostitution. Well, what about Fifty Shades of Grey? What about the TV we watch? What about the movies we accept, like Pretty Woman, and the fallacy that a woman really wants to be abused and prostituted, that there's really any aspect of glamour to it? You talk to any woman who's come out and is now telling her true story about the porn industry or about prostitution, and you learn it's not a choice. It's not a valid choice. This is the world's oldest, oldest form of oppression. It's not a legitimate occupation. You look at everything around us. Look at the brat styles that my daughters are being sold. Come on. What's that all about? It's about defiling them. And these are the small choices that we have to make every day and open our eyes to see. And you think this doesn't happen in the church? We know that we all have a sin nature, and we know that we're all struggling. And we know that sometimes in the American church, this is accepted. I know women who've come out of trafficking situations, and they're going through programs to find healing, and they're making progress, but they, they won't go to church. Someone who will not go to church, even when they're in a program for restoration, because they see too many men who have bought them. They've seen too many men who have frequented them. These are the attitudes, these are the behaviors that have to start in the church. If we really say we want to see human trafficking end, we really want to see injustice done away with, we want to make straight the way of the Lord as believers, then these are the things that we need to talk about, preach about, invite into our churches, and then live out every single day. And that's what this series is about. It applies to the church. And here's the thing, too, by the way. It's not the victim who deserves the blame. And Scripture makes that clear. In Hosea 4, it says, I'm not going to blame the women. I'm not going to blame your daughters who have been prostituted. I blame the men. It is on the men who have frequented. And this is about everyone's sin. This is about everyone's woundedness. But Scripture says, hey, men and fathers especially, let's step up. Let's honor these daughters of Eve who are all around us. And I believe as men, speaking to you as a man today, this is a big part of our message. There's only one way to do it, though, together, in openness. We can't do it alone. We cannot do this alone. We're all responsible. This is a God that we serve who loves justice and is pure and is holy, and he wants that for all of us. His desire is for the fatherless and the widow. His desire is for those of us who are broken and feeling the woundedness. Maybe that somebody else has done to us. I love it in Isaiah 42 where it says, I'm going to establish justice in the earth. My Messiah will come, and in the last day he will make all things new, and his justice will go forth. But you know what he says in the middle of that? He says, a bruised reed he will not break. Our God is so tender, and he wants this so desperately. But the first thing he wants before he transforms everything is our wounded hearts to come to him because he will care for us in a way we've never been cared for before. His grace will respond to that brokenness, and the deeper the brokenness, the greater his grace for us. That's a promise. That's his promise. So how, how do we live in this society? How do we live where this is a reality? What are the, what's the practical application? I want to give you four things. And I want to root it again in James 127, which has become a life verse for me, and again is kind of the essence of this whole series that we'll be going through over the next three weeks. James 127, which says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, to do justice, and to keep oneself unstained by the world, to pursue purity and walk in purity. 
These two go hand in hand. I didn't get this. When I was in law school, I'm like, okay, just let me out of this joint. Let me go put some people in jail. Let me go into the courtroom and make justice happen in the world. And I didn't realize until I came into ministry, I'm making choices every single day in the things I consume, in the media I watch, in the attitudes I hold that are creating the cultural soil out of which all this stuff flourishes. I'm contributing to that. God needs me to be pursuing a purity and a holiness first before I can do anything that's going to have an eternal impact in the society. That's the call for all of us. James 127, pure and undefiled religion. And what a beautiful promise, right? Because we just said we're living in a world that's prostituted and that is defiled by our sin and by this injustice. But the scripture says, hey, here's pure and undefiled religion that makes a difference. So what does this pure religion look like? Well, first of all, I'll tell you, it's a pure life. A lot of us have recognized that religion's not what we thought it was. It's really about relationship. But here James is talking about how do you take that relationship and walk it out? And that's what he means by pure religion. It's a pure life. So I'm going to give you four things for us to apply as we go out today and look for ways that God is moving on our hearts and then come back next week to go deeper into this. Four things. Prayer, understanding, resolve, and engagement. P-U-R-E. We try to make it easy. How do we live a pure life? Prayer, understanding, resolve, and engagement. It all starts with prayer. It all starts with prayer, and that's just talking to God. You know, I, I have a problem where I often think there's a science to this, and, and, and I'm not a good prayer, and I don't know how to do it, but I've learned all this is is just opening up my heart to God, just getting away and just talking to Him, even talking to Him like I would talk to myself maybe in the morning. Just be real and pour out your heart to Him. Let Him know what's, what scares you. What worries you? What are you concerned about? What are you embarrassed by? What do you hope? This is true prayer, just coming before him like that and praying without ceasing, as the Bible says, which doesn't mean just talking or flapping our lips or our minds always praying in a real way. It's putting ourselves in an attitude of worship and gratitude all the time, just resting and knowing that God is doing something every single moment of my day. And here's one thing I'll give you, which we call a pure help, 5158 prayer. You know, praying scripture is powerful. The old divines used to call the psalms the technology of prayer because it's what the Christian church used to use to pray, just pray through the psalms. So we have something we call 5158 prayer, which is praying through Psalm 51 and then Isaiah 58. And Psalm 51 is just all about saying, I'm a sinner, Lord, purify me. It's David praying after he sinned sexually, committed murder and adultery. He said, Lord, purify me. And then Isaiah 58 is one of our favorite texts that says God has come to free the captives, that this is the fast and the prayer he's chosen that people would be free, and that justice would be restored in our streets. So pray through that. Pray through Psalm 51. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Purify me today, and then make me go out in a way that impacts people and does justice. Second, understand. we got to understand. This is all part of understanding what we're doing today, getting exposed to an issue, and then seeing not just an issue and a new cause that we've got to get behind, that i got to get exhausted by and realize there's one more thing i got to put on my task list to do. All right, human trafficking. i got to end that today as well after I fill up the car with gas. No, no, no. This is something that is just overarching and all around us. So what do we do? We grow in it. You grow in your understanding. What does the Word of God say? There's a start. James 127. We know that. Grow in that. Scripture says to us, understanding is more precious than silver and gold, and this is continuous. So here's one place you can go, our website, purehope.net. In fact, this series is rooted in some of our resources. So check out our book called Exploited in our Bible study, which is right out there, and we can send you links. Real good place to take you to the whole world of what Scripture says and what organizations are doing and what's available for you to make a difference. Pray, understand, and then we got to resolve. And this is the big one for me the Lord's been putting on my heart. In Joshua chapter 24, Joshua says to the people of Israel, those people who came out of slavery, those people who said, do not prostitute your sons and daughters, he said, choose ye for yourselves who you're going to serve. But I and my house will serve the Lord. And that's really become a rallying cry for me. Every single day, I've got to choose who am I going to serve. Am I going to serve the Lord my God, which is going to do justice, it's going to bring love, and it's going to be pure, or am I going to serve the sinful nature of my own heart? and objectify people, and use people, and gratify myself. Every single day, we've got to resolve. And once we resolve, it leads us to an engagement that's effective. So you've heard a message today, we want to do something about it. Well, here's the first step. We engage with one another. We're about doing community together. We're about forgiving one another here at Loft City, and building each other up. And there's no other place, I think, that we need it more than in this area of our lives. Because here's the thing, we're all sexual beings. We're all male, and we're all female. And that has consequences. It has many, many benefits, 
But there's realities to that, that we're susceptible and vulnerable, and we need one another. So engage. That's just love being worked out, talking to one another. Share what you know boldly. Proverbs says, hey, don't be silent, but open up your mouth for those who are oppressed and exploited. Do that. Share what you know. You know, that might mean following, liking, retweeting Pure Hope or IGM or Love 146 or Exodus Cry or Unearthed Pictures, who we're partnering with on a great film, and that's been blowing up on social media. It might just be retweeting something. I'm going to tell you, though, it's more than that. Don't just retweet. Don't just go online. Speak with your mouth what you know. Say, hey, that joke's not funny, man. I, I, no, no I, I'm not going to. No, that, that's crass. I'm not going to laugh at that. No, don't say that. That bothers me. Speak. Just in the everyday moments of life, when we run up against this, when we hit up against this injustice and this impurity that's all around us, more importantly, let's do this with our actions. What am I reading? What am I watching? What am I clicking on? Let's communicate every single day that we are followers of Jesus who are being purified. And then serve where you're called. As you're being purified, serve where you're called. At Lost City, you're touching this community and you're doing work on the ground in India where you're rescuing those who are coming out of slavery and a life of exploitation. That happens right here in Dallas. You could connect with groups like New Friends, New Life or Restored Hope, groups that we're connected with if you want to talk to us afterwards. But more than that, we're all either a parent or we're a brother or we're a sister or we're a friend or we're a roommate. All of us have roles in our lives where we're touching other people and we have an opportunity to speak love, encouragement, to bring them out of maybe choices that they're making that we know are harmful. We can pray for them and we can be a model of Christ's love for them every single day. Because injustice like this is not just happening across the globe. It's right here, sometimes in our own dorms, right here at UTD. It's happening right around us. And that's the blessing that we have, that this is not something God puts in our face to say, look, go tackle this monster. No, he says, I will do that. You follow me. You live out a life every single day that models everything my Holy Spirit is doing within you. And let the word dwell in you richly so that you're equipped and prepared when you come up against those instances. There's great evil and injustice in our world, but Jesus has overcome them, and he will establish his justice. And through faith in him, we have forgiveness from our own bondage to sin and to brokenness. Let's rejoice in that today. I want to encourage you to rejoice. And while Leviticus 19 says that women and girls and we and all of us are exploited and prostituted and consume and are culpable for these things, he says, I have come that you might have life to forgive you and to give you my purity no matter what has happened. I am yours and you are mine. My holiness is yours. My hope is yours, says Jesus. And we can hold him tightly, as we sang earlier, as the darkness increases all around us. So let me encourage you, as I invite the guys to come up with worship, I'm going to close in prayer. But first of all, I just want you to think and take a moment. We've heard a lot today, and we've drilled it down. Where are you hurting? Where am I hurting? Where have I been challenged? Where have I been tempted? What's happened recently that I feel vulnerable in? Give these things to the Lord this week. As you come and you pursue a life of purity that's based on prayer, understanding, resolve, and engagement, as we get ready here at the end to take the elements of the Lord's table and to recognize and remember that his body was broken for us to save us and to save all those who were being exploited, as his blood was shed for us that we might all be purified and that the world might be set whole and that shalom might reign, Recognize that this first work is right here in our own hearts. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. And he wants to go deep and he wants to do with tenderness. So let me close this in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I thank you that you have brought all of us to this place. And I pray that your word, Lord, that's gone forth would not return void. I pray that right now your word, which you've given to us and which we have heard in community, would touch us exactly where we need it. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work and come upon us. I pray that those places where we're feeling guilt and shame or we've been wounded by those who have, should have protected us, Lord, I pray that you would come in and create newness of life. I pray that you would come in and give us hope. I pray that as we take these elements and remember that you were broken for us, that you poured out your life, that your blood was shed, that the blood of the Lamb is that which gives us victory and brings justice to the earth. Lord, I pray that this would be real to us. And then I pray that as a community we would go deeper because you said that when we confess our sins, 
when we confess our woundedness, when we confess those things that have hurt us, when we do that one with another, then you heal us and that you are faithful and just to forgive us. There is no secret in this room that you will not forgive. Lord, help us break the power of that secret. And I pray that when the power of that secret in our lives is broken, we will be able to go out and powerfully impact a world that is so desperate to break their own secrets. So we thank you, Lord. We pray that you inhabit our praises. And in this act of worship, of taking your table, that this would be real in a way that would profoundly change us, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.